morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to our service this Pentecost Sunday. If you're watching early in the day on Sunday and you're in the locality, the, the, the church building is going to be open today for you to come in and spend some time uh, praying on this Pentecost Sunday, if that's something that would be helpful for you. And then over the next uh, three or four Sundays, we're going to um, try something called Walk and Talk. Uh, we're not going to be starting services while there are uh, restrictions still in place around masks and singing and uh, other such things. Um, but we do want to uh, give the opportunity for people to begin to uh, to meet each other, to see each other once again. So if you would be up for uh, turning up next Sunday, anywhere between um, 10 and half 11, and um, just wandering off for a walk for, for half an hour, for an hour, for as long as you like with whoever else happens to be here. It all sounds a bit random, um, but we'd love to give you that opportunity to begin to, to meet one another again and uh, have those conversations. If you've got family, there's a great play park in the, uh, uh, the park up at Dowd's Farm. And so um, it really is for anyone. If the walking is a problem, don't worry, we'll put some tables and chairs out. Well, today is Pentecost and uh, we are going to be featuring uh, uh, that. Lou, Lou what's, uh, what's coming up? Mm. A, a number of our church family will be sharing their perceptions and experience of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Um, Daniel Houston Robb is being interviewed in 10 Questions. And we'll be watching a Suchet animation about Pentecost and joining together with some Pentecost prayers, inviting the Holy Spirit to come. Great. Sounds good. Are we going to pray before we start? Mm. Cool. Let's pray together. Father, we bring to you our world today. and We ask that you would bring peace in situations of unrest we ask that you'd bring your healing in situations of illness and that you'd bring your strength and your comfort to and your protection. Lord, for all those facing challenging circumstances today, we ask for your guidance and your presence with them. And as we join together on this Pentecost Sunday, we invite your Holy Spirit to come to fill us, to enable us to worship you and offer us offer you our praise. So come Holy Spirit and be with us today, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
God sends help. Jesus' friends and helpers huddled together in a stuffy upstairs room. Even though it was sunny outside, the shutters were closed, the door was locked. Wait in Jerusalem, Jesus had told them. I am going to send you a special present. God's power is going to come into you. God's Holy Spirit is coming. So here they were, waiting. Actually, mostly what they were doing was just being scared and hiding. Well, you can't blame them. Their best friend had left. The important people and leaders were after them, and Jesus had given them a job they didn't know how to do. As they waited, they were praying and remembering, remembering how, from the beginning, God had been working out his secret rescue plan. Suddenly, a strong wind filled the little room, whistling through the walls, rustling the straw on the floor, and there, on everyone's heads, shining in the gloom, were flickering flames, fire that didn't hurt or burn, and something more. Inside, in their hearts, they felt a strange heat, almost as if all the coldness and hardness were melting away, as if their broken hearts were mending, and God was giving them brand new hearts, hearts that could work properly. How it happened, they didn't know. But they knew God's power had struck their hearts ablaze, and Jesus himself, was coming to live inside them. They had seen Jesus go away, but now he was closer than he had ever been, inside their hearts. And this time, nothing could ever separate them. Jesus would always be there with them, loving them, whispering the promise that would get rid of the poison and the terrible lie and the sickness in their hearts. God's wonderful promise to them you are my child, and I love you. Make your home in me as I make my home in you, Jesus had said. Could it be? Heaven was coming into their hearts? They threw open the shutters. Sunlight flooded their room as love had flooded their hearts. And the little room was filled with happy noises, dancing feet, singing, laughing. They unlocked the door and surged out into the streets as if they had never been afraid. Peter spoke in a loud voice so everyone could hear. Jesus died for you, he said, because he loves you. But God made him alive again. He has rescued you. People stopped and listened. The words sank down deep into their hearts and worked like a medicine that makes you well, like the antidote to a deadly poison, like a kiss that wakes you from a deep sleep. Stop running away from God, Peter said. Run to him instead so he can love you and make you free. And Peter told them the wonderful story of God's love. God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. How Jesus had come, all that had happened. There were lots of people from faraway countries in Jerusalem. They couldn't speak the same language, but as they listened to Peter, everyone could understand what he was saying in their own languages. Many people believed and became Jesus' new friends and helpers. And the wonderful news of Jesus spread like sparks from a fire to villages, towns, cities. Every day, more and more people believed. And so it was that the family of God's children, his special people, grew. One man was watching. I'll stop this. Saul said. But this was God's plan, and nothing in all the world would ever be able to stop it. Hello, thank you for joining us today. What's your favourite food? 
what is my favourite food? Probably pasta or pizza. What is your favourite kind of holiday? Uh, my favourite kind of holiday would be if it was warm. Probably at the beach with my friends. If you could be in a film, which would it be? And what character would you play? Um, for the film and what character I'd play, I'd probably Sherlock Holmes because it's quite, it'd be quite cool to be a detective and be that clever. What do you do in your spare time? In my spare time, I play video games and watch YouTube. What is your favourite worship song? My favourite worship song would probably be My Lighthouse. If you could rid the world of one thing, what would it be? If I could get rid of one thing, it would be suffering. Apart from the Bible, which book would you like on a desert island? If I was on a desert island, I'd probably want a big book of puzzles to help pass the time. What is the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Um, best piece of advice I've ever been given? Uh, if there's nothing you can do about it, then it's not worth worrying about. Did you have a nickname growing up? I had a nickname growing up. It was Super, which means little chicken in Russian. If you could invent a gadget, what would it be? If I could invent a gadget, it would probably be some sort of space travel or teleportation. Thank you. That's been really interesting. Thank you so much for talking to us. past 11 days, millions of Christians around the world have been asking God to empower us by his spirit to be effective witnesses for Jesus. Though many of us cannot gather in large numbers to mark this day, we join together from home to home to unite in praying for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. When Jesus predicted Pentecost, 
he said, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Acts 1 verse 8. Acts 2 verses 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak to each other in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Mahal na mahal ako ng Panginoong Diyos. God houd van jou. Muti mo, wow nga ata. Bok liebe tibia. Gaspoit tibia liubit. Dios te ama. Jetem. Dios te ama. Oh, Jesus te ama. Dios vos am tus. Dios te ama. Isten seret tiged. Boja volinte. God loves you. The Holy Spirit, the great healer, comforter, and director of our lives. Wow. The Holy Spirit is God. And when I feel the Holy Spirit's presence resting and residing in me, uh, particularly during times of real intense, engaged worship, uh, I therefore feel the presence of God resting uh, on and in me. Um, so that's a very tangible, very real feeling I would get in, in, in those intense worship moments. I would also say the Holy Spirit for me is, is a, the guiding factor that, that takes me through the small and the big moments in life. It's, it's who would guide decisions and uh, direction. Um, yeah, both big and little. The Holy Spirit is my guide. He guides me closer and closer to Jesus. And if I start going backwards or I start to take a detour, then he points me back in the right direction. The Holy Spirit for me is a direct and open interaction with God. The Holy Spirit to me conjures up excitement as when the Holy Spirit comes, it can be unpredictable but it's real. It's not learning about God or about Jesus. It's that direct interaction. For me, for example, when I receive a message or a word that comes into my mind, that there's no way on earth I would know what's come into my mind. But when I share it with a particular person, for them, it's true. And it reveals something that I don't know, but God knows about them. For example, I didn't know what to get somebody for their birthday. And in my head, I just got baked some scones. I thought it was a bit silly, but I did bake the scones. And when I took the scone to that person, it was amazing because that was the one thing that they wanted for their birthday. So many more examples I can give you, but I think Louise wants to keep it short. So for me, the Holy Spirit is real, alive, supernatural power. I was talking to one of my friends the other day about the most life-changing experiences that I've ever had. And one that comes to mind is a day when at the church I was attending, we had a special meeting uh, to receive the Holy Spirit into our hearts. And I remember praying as there was probably about 20 of us there and we were all praying to receive the Holy Spirit and what an experience the power of God came down and I was never the same again because I had that extra faith that extra strength and knowing that actually part of God was within me it's a glorious thing when I think about the Holy Spirit I think about him having guiding hands to help us in our day-to-day -day endeavours. To me, the Holy Spirit is a friend, a guide and a constant companion. My comforter who carries me through the most difficult times. The Holy Spirit is my guide and my protector. Because he is with me, I know that nothing can stand against me. Morning, everyone. 
Uh, when I think about the Holy Spirit, I'm reminded of what it says in the Bible in John 14, 27, where it says, we're given a peace that's unlike anything the world can offer us. So for me, the Holy Spirit is peace and comfort that is unending and never changing. Um, when I think of the Holy Spirit, I think of, of um, dynamite, is what I think of. I think of the Holy Spirit as my enabler. He enables me to do things that I don't think I'd be able to do and to face situations that I would normally be worried about. So the Holy Spirit is my enabler. Creator God, who formed humanity from dust, breathe in me again, revive me and sanctify me with the power of your Spirit. Set my heart on fire with the good news of your Gospel. Thank you, Father, that you love to give the Spirit to those who ask. And so, on this very special day, I invite you now, Spirit of the Living God, to enter my home and to fill me too in powerful, disruptive ways. I pray now for a renewed mobilisation of Spirit-empowered mission, an outpouring of fresh confidence in the Gospel this Pentecost. Lord, I silently name before you now people I know who do not yet know you and ask you to give me opportunities to be your witness to them. And so as your people gather around the world today, I thank you Lord for your beautiful multicultural intergenerational family. Revive us, sanctify us and unite us once again I pray. Forgive our many sins and make us holy. Set our hearts on fire again with the good news of your gospel. Thou Christ of burning, cleansing flame, thy blood-bought gift today we claim. Look down and see this waiting host. We want another Pentecost. Send the fire, send the fire, send the fire.
power, power dressing, power hungry, power tools, power walk, power nap, power shower, flower power, power of love, power. It's May, the British springtime. Oh, we've seen the power of nature this week. Thunderstorms, trees down, gale force winds. Never mind all that. Today is Pentecost and we think about the power of the spirit. Definition of power, the ability or capacity to do something or act in a particular way. That's the disciples, maybe. The second one, the capacity or ability to direct or influence the behaviour of others or the course of events. Well, that's the spirit at Pentecost, isn't it? Power. Last week, we thought about the disciples' um, ascension, looking up at the sky as Jesus returns to heaven, being asked by men in white robes, what are you doing here? Looking up at the sky, heading back to Jerusalem, weighing up all the things that Jesus had said to them. Go! But don't go until you've waited for the Holy Spirit to come and give you the power for the mission which I am bestowing upon you. And so they wait. If you were hanging around with the disciples, I guess the prevailing vibes between Easter and Pentecost could have been summed up in words such as fear, um, confusion, bewilderment, joy as well. There there were moments of joy as they realised that Jesus was uh, alive, that he was risen, but it's predominantly a a sense of what the heck is going on around here. And then Pentecost, wind and fire, and the whole thing ignites like, like, like fireworks. It's incredible. And the disciples have the capacity to do something or act in a particular way as per that definition. Now, I don't know where you are watching from right now. I'm led to believe that a growing number of people are watching church while they're still in bed. If that's you and like fire descended right now into your bedroom, you're going to panic. At HESA this morning, Paul tested the fire alarms. I hope in your house you've got smoke alarms because we know fire is dangerous. But fire represents power too. The harnessing of fire gave Uh, humankind influence over our environment that we'd never known before. Let's step back. We have to remember that these guys are also Jewish believers as they as they pray. There's the sound of wind from heaven and then fire, um, tongues of fire. These disciples are steeped in the stories of the Exodus, the Jewish people being delivered from Egypt through Sinai to the promised land, being led by a pillar of fire. So when fire descends, light bulbs go on because this is a story from oppression to freedom. God's fire falls. There's a journey to take from captivity, captivity sorry, to liberty, from fear and bewilderment to freedom. Something is happening. And I guess all of a sudden the words of Jesus began to make sense to them. This is what he meant. This is what he was talking about. This must be the spirit that he spoke of. Now, I think we experience something of this. We, we have a sense of what God is saying, what he's doing, and we don't always understand. And we have to take it and receive it by faith. And we have to wait. And then there's a moment where things crystallise and we understand God is at work. And in Jerusalem, God was at work. The the wind and the fire cause a huge commotion and the noise draws a crowd. It's festival time. Pentecost was a festival, festival of weeks. Jerusalem is full of people from all over the place, different nations, and they suddenly hear their own language being spoken. And I find a challenge in that for the church, for Christians today to communicate in language and actions that, that, that send the gospel into culture. Help us to connect with our contexts, Lord. Give us relevance for the hour. Anyway, Peter, once the crowd is there, preaches his famous Pentecost sermon, which is centred on the person of Jesus as the chosen one who through his crucifixion and resurrection has conquered death. He is the Messiah. And the crowd respond. They want in. And 3,000 people are added to this fledgling church in one day. Jesus, Jesus who brings us life, eternal, yet beginning now. Jesus who moves us away from oppression to freedom, from death to life, from darkness to light, towards places of love, of generosity, of hospitality, 
transformed people who live to transform the world. This is the Jesus who we can trust our whole lives with. Paul uses a phrase for people who live uh, with their lives offered to Jesus. He calls it in Christ. And he says they're the visible display of the infinite, limitless riches of God. And it's a gift, not a reward to be earned, a, a gift to be received. All there in Ephesians 2. And here the disciples are modelling for us what happens when transformed lives impact a community. Acts 2, we read that there's, there's sharing, there's wonder, there's generosity, there's love, there's miracles, there's worship, there's learning, there's growth, numerical growth, people being added all the time. Can you imagine living in times like that? I find the phenomenon of electric bikes really interesting. I know we've got a growing posse of people who have these uh, bikes with the luxury of knowing that when you're out and about, you've got this, uh, this assistance, this additional power that's there to call on. And I totally get it. Um, never mind the exercise, you're struggling up a hill, really the legs are burning and then the battery kicks in and the power flows. Now, if we stop for a moment and we ask ourselves if that picture speaks to us, you know, imagine pedalling away furiously in our own strength and then think about all that power kicking in. Why would we not want that power if it's available? My first post-COVID bike ride a couple of months ago saw my heart rate head north of 160 BPM as I pedalled up a hill. I would have given anything for another source of power on that occasion. A couple of questions for us. If we ask God today to fill us with his spirit, whether for the first time or for the 50th, what difference might it make to you, to me? What difference might it make to our neighbourhoods? In what ways would I, would you become different people if we were fully energised by the spirit of God? What would become easier? What would become more natural? What would we expect to change? What fears would we overcome? How would our next door neighbours tangibly benefit? How might our ch churches be transformed? Look, as Hedge End Salvation Army feels its way forward in a deliberate, thoughtful, maybe quite a slow, it might feel like, manner, the key question is this, not when will we meet, but who will we be when we meet? Who will we be? This afternoon, it's, it's Friday, um, I'm attending a, a funeral via Zoom. It's the funeral of one of the most inspirational men I ever met, a gentleman called Doug Collin, a man who lived his life in the power of the spirit for sure, a great man. I remember him doing a talk once um, about Ichabod in the Old Testament. Eli's grandson was born into some tragic circumstances and he was named Ichabod meaning the spirit of the Lord has departed, such was the hopelessness of his, his, his times. Stain Salvation Army Church was a few months from moving into a new building and Doug preached on the idea that Ichabod would not be the name that you wanted written across your church. He described walking past a, a pet shop in Staines High Street and his attention being caught by a sign attached to a hamster cage that said, by the cage, get the hamster free. Uh, it was dead funny, he talked about this, this, this bizarre idea of why you would want a cage without the hamster. And he applied this to the church. Why would you want a church without the spirit? Because just as the hamster brings life to the cage, I mean, without the hamster, it's lifeless. So it's the spirit that brings life to the church. And what is the church? It's people, it's you and it's me. And the spirit is the one who animates the whole darn thing. Maybe the Lord whispers to us today, to you, to me, literally right now, ask me in, invite me in. I'm standing at the door and knocking, open up to me. I would love to give you good gifts, just ask me in. I'm just going to move into a prayer now. It's a, a piece of uh, visual liturgy taken from the, the Work of the People website and it's a prayer called Beginning in Jerusalem. It's all the dis, uh, disciples did. They received the Spirit, the power of God 
than they began where they were. I hope and I pray that I, <laughs> that you, that we will do the same. Begin in the brightly painted kitchens, at the table set for supper and on the wide couches where we watch TV. Begin while we are sorting the laundry, writing out the shopping list and in front of our bathroom mirrors. Begin in the barns among the warmth of animals and the smells of grain and manure. Begin in the growing fields and in the flooded pastures and where the rains have not come and the soil is cracked and hard. Begin in the gleaming office towers, the shiny shopping malls, the sweaty factory floors. Begin on crumbling sidewalks and amid the rumble of subways, at machines, at our desks, by the coffee makers and computers. Begin with the rich, the comfortable. Begin with the poor, the desperate. Among the successful, the self-assured. Among the failed and the floundering. In the glitter of the halls of power and in the cold and shadowed corners of tragedy and defeat. Begin on a day when the sun is brilliant, on a day when the sky is gray, in a time when economies are favorable, in a time when all is rust, at the moment when leaders are caring, or amid indifference, hostility, despair. Let us begin beginning again, and whether we have begun and triumphed or begun and struggled and faltered, we will continue our beginning as we have from our beginning at Jerusalem, which is wherever and whoever we are.